So we've been looking together at the stories of the process of transformation that we find in John's Gospel. And we begin this journey with the miracle of water to wine as a symbol of what was about to unfold in the upcoming ministry of Jesus, in which Jesus would take the very limited framework of grace that the purity system of the Jews had, had established and exploded into an abundant access to grace. For in the purity codes, only certain people had access to the saving grace of God, and Jesus wanted to make that grace accessible for all. And he goes about doing that one <coughs> engagement at a time throughout the Gospel of John. And today we have the experience of a man who journeys from the limited grace of his sickness to the abundant grace of his healing and his wholeness. And it's a wonderful story. It happens in a pool called the Pool of Bethsaida or the Pool of Bethesda, which if you look at Jerusalem, it's just outside the walls on the northeastern edge near the Gate of the Sheep. And the story begins saying there was a festival in Jerusalem, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, when we were in Israel uh, this last September, our guide kept saying, Aliyah, 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 which means in Hebrew to go up. We're going up. We're going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a mountain, and the only way you get there is by going up. And so Jesus goes up to the Mount of Jerusalem, and as he's coming in the sheep, he passes by the Pool of Bethesda. Now this was a site that was historically a site for healing, and it was because there were thermal waters that bubbled up into that pool from time to time, and it was, a, it was sourced by something like hot springs, right? And have any of you ever been to the thermal pools, uh, healing pools, hot springs, Arkansas, even hot springs, here it used to be a, a healing site of that kind. It was a, it was a uh, what's the word I want? Not a sauna. It was a spa. It was like a spa, right? Well, in those days, people also believed that the waters that came from thermal uh, pockets in the earth had healing properties as well. And so they were often used by people who needed help. And these waters were no different. They were used by the Jews. They were also claimed during some of the Roman and Greek uh, periods. Uh, and there was a temple on this site to one of the Greek gods of healing. Well, this was the place, Bethesda, where the lame, the infirm, the paralyzed, the broken, the blind would gather. And it was outside the gates, right? Outside the gates. Because you don't want to contaminate the holy city with all that brokenness. Now, Bethsaida, or Bethesda, in Aramaic or Hebrew, depending on which language it, or it originates from, means either the house of mercy or the house of grace. But it can also mean a place of disgrace interestingly and paradoxically. And at, at play for us today is how that word will be manifest in this particular man's life. Will it be a house of grace and abundance or will it be a place of disgrace or dist grace as we might say today? The man is there and has been lying on his mat for 38 years. That was his home for 38 years. Jesus' entire life and then some. He had been laying by this pool because 
the tradition at the pool of Bethsaida is that periodically the thermal waters would bubble up and people perceive them to be at that moment filled with power to heal. In fact, the Jewish tradition was an angel troubled the waters. And when the waters were troubled, that was when you had to get in to be made well. But this fellow couldn't get in by himself. We don't know exactly what was wrong with him, but presumably something was wrong with his legs at least because he couldn't make it to the water. There's a spiritual weight in the water. Weight in the water, children. Weight in the water. Gods are gonna trouble the water. That song brings together the tradition of the pool of Bethsaida and the possibility for healing with the journey of the Israelites out of slavery and into freedom and very aptly blends them together to help us understand that wading in the water is about moving from slavery to freedom, from being trapped to being free. Which is exactly what's about to happen in the story today. As Jesus comes up to the pool at Bethsaida, there are probably dozens, if not hundreds, of people who are infirm in one way or another, all over the steps and porticos around this pool. Blind, lame, broken, paralyzed. You name it, it was there. And for some reason, we don't know, Jesus picks out of all of these people, one guy, one guy. He doesn't heal everybody. He heals one guy. And he says to him, and this is the crux of this text today, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? He'd been there for 38 years. <coughs> he made himself at home on that map. He'd accommodated himself to the reality that he was never going to get in the pool. And he presents his excuse to Jesus. <laughs> what am I going to do? No, I'm not. I can't get to the pool and there's nobody to carry me. Anybody who maybe was with me for a while is no longer with me anymore. The water boils, but I can't get there. What am I going to do? <clears throat> Jesus says, do you want to be healed? That question is the question I want us to look at today. Because I think there are a lot of us that need to hear it. In Jesus' time, people who had physical deformities were pushed to the outskirts, to the margins. And they were done that way because the very law of Moses talks about people with those kinds of infirmities as ritually impure. L listen to these verses from Leviticus, chapter 21, starting in verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, for the generations to come, none of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God, to present an offering at the temple or in the tabernacle in this case. Huh? No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or hand or who is hunchbacked or dwarfed or who has any eye defect or who has festering or running sores or damaged testicles. Interesting. <laughs> no descendant of Aaron the priest who has any defect is to come near to present offerings to the Lord. 
Moses had not heard of the ADA. <laughs> and it took us millennia, millennia, as human beings, to come to a place where we recognize the humanity, the full humanity, of those who have deformities. But what about the other kinds of deformities that some of us carry around for 38 or 48 or 58 years? I know people who have spent decades wandering in the wounded wilderness of a broken relationship or a broken marriage that they cannot be taken from. They cannot stand up from. Or those who have been so consumed by the loss of someone they love to death that they walk in grief the rest of their days, unable to find their way beyond it. Or those of us who are wounded by some act or action of another person that have grieved us or injured us so deeply that we cannot stand up and forgive and be made well. We too walk wounded. We carry wounds for so long that when Jesus comes up to us and says to us, Rob, do you really want to be healed? Or are you so happy with this thing that you carry constantly that you are going to carry it for the rest of your life? Do you want to be healed? It's an important question for us to look at. Because I think healing is not just about our bodies being fixed, but I think healing fundamentally goes to a sense of being able to dwell in the love and the grace of God and feel whole there, no matter what our bodies say. Two friends of mine I want to tell you about today. One is Duncan Borland. Duncan was a classmate of mine in seminary. Duncan was the pinnacle of physical prowess when he was in, in his early 20s. He had a full ride scholarship to an Ivy League school as a water polo player. Full ride, completely covered. And sometime during his first or second year in college, he was standing outside waiting for a bus, leaning on a <coughs> lamppost, and his legs completely gave out underneath him. His legs, the legs he needed to play water polo, stopped working. He was diagnosed with MS. He never got his legs back. In fact, the disease continued to progress week by week, year by year, until eventually it killed him. But that was not all of Duncan's story. He lost the scholarship, couldn't go to school, family couldn't afford to keep him there, ended up going to community college, found his way to seminary, where he rode around the campus on a little motorized scooter and was one of the most brilliant students that we had on campus. But the MS continued. But not one time did I ever hear Duncan complain about his MS. Why? Because it was MS that led him to God. He never would have got there if it hadn't been for God removing all of the things that gave him his identity and his pride. And so Duncan spent his days as an ordained pastor in a motorized wheelchair right here in San Antonio at Morningside Manor, ministering to the senior citizens who lived lives very similar to his, crippled, limited, 
and he pastored them until he died. The other person I want to tell you about is Xavier. Jamie? This is Xavier. Xavier is a student at UTSA here in San Antonio. Xavier's in his early 20s. He's studying uh, computer cybersecurity. And Xavier is a bodybuilder. Xavier was the just past director for CIFAR, an organization, a nonprofit that Victor and I have been associated <coughs> with. Xavier stands about this tall. Thanks to birth defects, Xavier was born without arms. Xavier was born this tall. But Xavier now is about to graduate from college and help with cybersecurity for this nation. Now, it would have been really easy for somebody like Xavier to go, why God, why God, why God? And live in that pity pool for his entire life. Very easy. But that is not his way. <clears throat> Xavier has picked up his mat and stood on his feet. And he walks into a gymnasium with guys who are twice his height and five times his bulk, and he works out as hard as any of them. And he types on his computer with his nubs. He can't even pick up food or a glass with his arms. He has to eat off a plate with his tongue. But he has a spirit as big as Texas. And Xavier inspires me whenever I feel like going, oh, woe is me. I'll never get over this. Because you see, the paradox of healing is that we can be whole even when we are broken. Hear that. We can be whole even when we are broken. And the invitation that Jesus extends to the man is to claim that he can be whole even when he is broken. He invites him to stand. But the guy has got to get up by himself. So where is the payoff for us here? Where does it come home? Where are the places that you have chosen to live in your brokenness? and not want to be healed. Where are those places? Because we all have them. We all have the wounded place that we don't want to let go of. We all have the, the injuries to our self-esteem. We all have the, the physical infirmities that make us upset and discouraged. We all have something. But the question is, do you want to be whole? Because you can be whole even while you carry the brokenness. The grace and the mercy are big enough to help you carry that to pick up the mat that has become your home of pity and to carry it instead with some measure of dignity and worth. You can do that. The place of disgrace can become a house of grace ample enough to make you whole too. That transformation is what Jesus invites you and me to
consider today. Let us pray. God, forgive us when we wallow. Sometimes we just have to for a little while. But forgive us for not believing your grace is big enough, sufficient enough, abundant enough to help us carry our broken places with some measure of wholeness and dignity and freedom. Grant us, we pray, the grace that was given to this man by the pool that we may stand up and roll up our mat and walk with our heads held high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God who makes us whole. Grateful for the God whose grace is greater than we are even able to imagine. Let us return to this forgive of our pride. Thank mm -hmm. you.